Welcome back. Today we're going to discuss Traceroute, complete with some of its issues, and then look at an improved version of Traceroute that addresses some of these. This is presented in a paper called Avoiding Traceroute Anomalies with Paris Traceroute, and as we have done with other papers in this series, we'll be using the slides from the original authors. Something to keep in mind when looking at this paper is that Traceroute itself is a hack. We're used to thinking of it as a mundane network troubleshooting tool, but when you think about it, the IP network layer was not designed to expose paths to the network. And so the Traceroute tool is actually tricking it into revealing this information through eliciting error messages, namely the TTL expired messages from each router along the path. It turns out that this is not ideal, and the paths that we learn from this method are often inaccurate or incomplete. In particular, we may observe what are called diamonds, loops, or cycles that don't in fact exist in the network. And the improved version of Traceroute presented in this paper helps eliminate some of these artifacts. First, let's review how Traceroute works. We're always sending probes from a source to a destination, and we set the TTL on these probes to a low value, starting with 1. So the first probe is going to expire at the first router along the way. We've now learned interface A0. It's important to recognize that an IP address does not uniquely identify a router. Instead, it identifies a particular interface on the router. Then we send a packet with TTL2, and we learn an interface on the second router. And in this case, the TTL3 packet arrives at the destination, and we know to stop probing. If the destination were to probe in reverse, it would learn two different identifiers, even though they're on the same routers, because it would be seeing interface 1 on B and A, where our original trace route learned interface 0 on A and B. So that was a very simple example. As we know, the internet is very complex, and so typically our trace route responses will be much more ambiguous. Here's an example. This implementation of trace route is sending three probes per TTL. And while all of the probes at hop 1 and hop 4 learn interface A and interface F respectively, the probes at TTL 2 and 3 come back with two different interfaces at each hop. Now it's safe for us to infer that A is connected to both B and C, and likewise that both D and E connect to F. Although as we go on, we'll see even cases where that latter assumption doesn't hold true. But the real question in this scenario is, what do the connections look like between hop 2 and hop 3? We can't infer anything from the BCB ordering. It's effectively random whether a particular probe follows one path or the other. For example, if we run the same trace route over again, we get a different sequence for hops 2 and 3. So that's not significant, and we still don't know how to connect hop 2 to hop 3. By the way, the overall process that we're going through here is called topology inference. We are inferring a topology based on the observed router interfaces found by Traceroute. And the cause of our ambiguity is load balancing. At router A, traffic is being load balanced across two different paths, and then it is being aggregated at router F. So here we have our actual and inferred topologies. The load balancing that happens at L sends our TTL2 packet to A, but then load balances our TTL3 packet onto the other path, and it arrives at D. If we just send one probe at each TTL, we would have no idea this is happening, and we've just inferred an incorrect link between A and D that doesn't exist in the real topology. No matter which path it takes, our next packet expires at E, and we infer the link between D and E and get to the destination. Not only have we missed a bunch of the topology, we've also inferred a link that doesn't even exist. If we do this multiple times or use multiple probes per TTL, the error induced may be somewhat different. So we have the topology that we got on the first run, but assuming we also discover the true links between L and B and B and D, we would now infer a false diamond. So the top path shows the true diamond caused by load balancing, but we've inferred a diamond that is incorrect, where it looks like the aggregation is happening at node D. Further runs may yield another false link between B and C, and another false diamond. And note that we still haven't discovered the link between A and C. To make matters even more complicated, true diamonds do not always consist of equal length paths on both sides of the load balancing. So when we trace right over this, here we have TTL2 expiring at B, TTL3 expiring at D, and now TTL4 also expiring at D because it took a longer path to get there. So now it looks like we have a routing loop where D appears twice in the sequence. 
and then we reach the destination when we send out TTL5, no matter which route that packet takes. But it can get even worse than this. Now we've added another router in the longer leg of the load balance path. And so in this scenario, we have TTL2 revealing B, TTL3 revealing D, TTL4 arrives at E, and TTL5 takes the same longer path and arrives at D. So now we have a routing loop including D and E. So our revealed path is L, B, D, E, D, and then the destination. So while in some cases there can be real routing loops in the internet, typically temporary, trace routing over such a topology would make it look like there was a routing loop happening all the time, when in fact there is no routing loop. Now it's time to mention that there are a couple different types of load balancing. These are per packet load balancing and per flow load balancing. The reason this exists is because TCP doesn't handle out of order packets very well. So in order to not degrade TCP performance, which is the vast majority of internet traffic, load balancers are designed to keep all the packets from one TCP flow on the same leg of a load balanced path. And this is called per flow load balancing. So the load balancer uses a hash of the flow's five tuple and divides up the hash space across the load balance legs. The alternative to this is per packet load balancing, where the load balancer randomly sends packets on either leg of the load balance path. And this is likely to result in packets arriving at E in a slightly different order than they were sent and can cause problems for TCP. So per packet load balancing is much less common in the internet than per flow load balancing. We might think that per flow load balancing would keep our packets on the same legs. So we wouldn't infer these false links. However, this is not the case. Even though a TCP flow would be routed over the same leg, the tracer application uses port numbers to provide sequencing. So it's changing the port number with each probe it sends out for a new TTL. And this means that subsequent probes in the same trace route don't actually belong to the same flow from the load balancer's perspective, because all the packets in a given flow are supposed to have the same port numbers. So per flow load balancing doesn't help our trace route problem. But this description does give us some insight into how we might fix this. In addition to load balancing, there's other reasons we might have anomalies in our traceroute output. In this case, we're trace routing from the source to destination, and buggy router A doesn't respond when the TTL expires. It forwards the packet even though the TTL is zero. And so B then has to respond to the TTL zero packet. And so the first router that the source observes is B. And then when it sends out TTL2, that also arrives at B and gets expired. And so now we have B in the path twice, even though in reality, there's no routing loop going on here. So again, our inferred path is incorrect in this case due to buggy software on router A. Then we have the issue of NAT boxes or middle boxes in general, which can cause unexpected behaviors. So in this case, we've trace routed through router A successfully. TTL2 arrives at the router that is running NAT, network address translation, and that is our destination address. However, remember NATs do port-based forwarding. So if our packet happens to be destined to a port that is forwarded, instead of getting the expected port unreachable to NAT box, we just get a TTL expired, and then we continue to get trace route results beyond the destination. However, all of these are translated at the NAT box, and so we can get multiple responses at different TTLs from the destination address, which then again can appear as some sort of weird loop, depending on whether the traceroute program even accepts these additional responses. It may be possible for us to use a combination of the TTL field and IPID field to indicate whether this is what's happening. So Paris Traceroute, the improved traceroute version being proposed in this paper, can't fix router bugs or the existence of NAT boxes, but it addresses the issue of per flow load balancing yielding incorrect results. Remember that the original traceroute application used the port number as a sequence number to identify the probes as they return. Paris Traceroute instead uses the UDP checksum. Of course, the checksum is supposed to be determined by the other header fields and the payload. So to do this, Paris Traceroute must manipulate the payload in such a way that it yields the desired checksum. However, since the checksum math is so simple, this is a relatively easy process. So now when we have flow-based load balancing, our traceroute probes will all use the same destination port number, doesn't have to be port one, and so they will all follow the same leg of the load balanced path. The checksum instead will be manipulated to yield the sequence number that traceroute needs to put the results back in order, but the checksum is not used for load balancing, so it won't cause the problem we had with traditional traceroute. 
Of course, if we only run Paris Tracer at once, we will only learn one leg of a load balanced path. Running it a second time, we have some probability of learning the same leg over again, particularly if we run it with the same destination port number. So if we wanted to be sure to discover all the legs of the load balanced paths between our source and destination, we need to run Paris Tracer out multiple times with different destination port numbers. Now that we've seen the design of this tool, we can talk a bit about the measurement infrastructure that the author set up in order to test it. They measured from one source through the internet to 5,000 destinations, running both traditional traceroute and Paris traceroute. So the expectation is that these will discover the same paths, except in the cases where load balancing takes place. Of course, it turns out that load balancing is highly prevalent in the internet, so this affects a large portion of the paths. As we said, they cannot address all the causes of anomalies in traceroute data. They're specifically looking at the anomalies that are observed when running classic traceroute over per-flow load balanced paths. And these include diamonds, loops, and cycles. And as we've said, all of these can be real. So the question is, how many of these are being introduced by traditional traceroute and how many are real? From their vantage point, they saw diamonds in 30% of the destinations, but 56% of those were removed by using Paris Traceroute. It makes sense that many of these would be real because real diamonds are an artifact of load balancing. Loops, on the other hand, occur when there's an error in routing or router configuration, and we see that Paris Traceroute removes almost 90% of the observed loops, so most of those were an artifact of Traceroute, and the remaining ones are the real errors and problems in the routing protocol. Cycles were much more scarce than loops to begin with, and again, are the result of errors in routing and router configuration, and the majority of those are removed by running Paris Traceroute as well. The things that Paris Traceroute can't address include real routing changes, which can result in temporary routing loops and cycles, NAT boxes, which cause Traceroute to infer incorrect results, and routers with bugs in their code, or the case of per packet load balancing. So in conclusion, classic traceroute infers anomalies that don't actually exist in the network. And most of these are caused by per-flow load balancing. Remember we said the per-flow load balancing is the majority of the load balancing because it's required for TCP to perform well. So the result is that Paris traceroute removes the majority of these anomalies, and so we can get a more accurate view of the network topology. With this tool in place, there's much more work to do on characterizing the internet, in particular the use of load balancing. We also want to mention that this paper is very interesting from a traffic analysis perspective because it has both a traffic analysis methodology, but it's also updating one of the core traffic analysis tools, namely Traceroute. This paper came out a number of years ago, and in the intervening time, Paris Traceroute has become the de facto standard for performing topology inference using Traceroute. The Paris Traceroute algorithm, however, is not incorporated into the Traceroute tools that are standard on all operating systems. So to use Traceroute for topology analysis, we need to install our own Traceroute tools. That's all for now. We'll see you on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.